corruption, brutality and a staggering failure to investigate crime. To some of the challenges bedeviling our police service. Before the break, you saw the impact of that on the community in Umtata in the Eastern Cape, where it's claimed some SAPS members are enthusiastic participants in crime. To discuss this issue in more detail, we're joined in studio by author and policing and security analyst, Ziander Stirman. Ziander, thank you so much for joining us. Now, I've read reports that describe our SAPS as undertrained, uncontrolled and deadly. Is that a fair assessment? So I think really the question, particularly of training, is an incredibly nuanced one. Uh, you know, our police officers go through what's called the basic development and learning plan, where they spend 10 months in a police academy, 12 months in a work experience, uh, workplace experience in a police station, and then two months doing assessments. So that's 24 months we're talking about, which is quite a, a lengthy amount of time for training and definitely meets uh, in international standards. The main issue is really what happens after training. Mm -hmm. Once police officers are in police stations, and particularly once they're under the command of senior uh, leaders within the police or, or station commanders who don't respect the rule of law, mm -hmm. who look away when police officers engage in corruption or are violent and brutal. And I think that's really uh, the core of the issue here. I mean, in our story tonight, we highlighted Nam Tham Twa's murder, shot nine times in her driveway, evidence not properly gathered. I mean, key witnesses not interviewed. What does this tell us? I mean, isn't this basic detective work? Yeah. I think in the tragic killing uh, of, of Nan Tham Twa, I think we really have seen the failure of police on many fronts. You know, all police officers are trained in the basics uh, of preserving evidence, of taking uh, statements. But then what's meant to take over is specialist training. Uh, and that really involves investigating, following up on leads, putting connections together in order to create a, uh, put together a good docket uh, that then is taken for prosecution. I think what we've seen here is a failure on policing, mm -hmm. really from the basics, from the ground, all the way up. What is it going to take to dent our crime stats? Because at this rate, there's no dent being made. Yeah. I think the really tough thing about uh, crime stats is that they're, they're good in terms of a snapshot in time. And especially with quarterly crime stats, what they can show us over a longer period of time are trends in crime. I think what, what uh, needs to be analysed right alongside those are you know, successful uh, prosecutions, but also the ability of the police or inability of the police to solve murders. According to uh, research done by the, the Institute for Security Studies, the police at this point are only solving about 19% of all murders reported to them. We're talking about, an, on average, about 20,000 murders a year in the country. So when you have very low uh, uh, investigation mm. and therefore um, detection rates, you know, it's very difficult to prosecute cases and it's really difficult then to understand or, or we can see why and we can understand why crime stats, uh, you know, look the way that they do. And at the very same time, we have very, very low uh, successful prosecutions. I mean, we heard from our case studies and that story before the break, how they've lost confidence in the police. I mean, when we report about complicity of certain SAPS members, who should those communities then turn to if police officers are also allegedly complicit in these crimes? Mm. What we really need here is consequence management. Yeah. Um, what, what is failing uh, really from IPED uh, or the Independent uh, Police Investigative mm -hmm. Directorate is real teeth and real grit to their work. Um, and what that should really mean is that police officers do not feel that they have the impunity to act uh, the way that police officers were described in the story earlier. We really need to see both IPED stepping up but at the same time, police leadership at every rank uh, across the board taking responsibility for discipline and accountability uh, within the service itself. I mean, right now, it seems like it's so brazen. Why is it able that there's, there's corruption at the door of the police station? Mm. I think a lot of that really has to go uh, you know, with the fact that, that discipline systems have fallen apart. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have the police minister whose real job it is to create policy uh, that, you know, puts in accountable measures for police officers when they are brutal, when they're violent and when they're corrupt. And when you don't have, uh, you know, the police minister or even the national uh, commissioner for police making sure that those policies are in place, that those systems are in place, that IPID is supported, all of that turns into an ecosystem or an ecosystem collapse that really allows 
even the basic, uh, you know, examples of corruption to take mm. place with absolutely no consequences. I mean, does IPID even have enough teeth mm. to handle this? The short answer is no. Um, you know, this is a, an institution that is meant to be a watchdog, uh, you know, over the police service. It is a large service itself. And IPID finds itself under-resourced, uh, you know, not having enough staff and certainly not having enough resources uh, in terms of um, equipment uh, or even uh, personnel to really be able to grapple with uh, the nearly 5,200 cases that were reported uh, or complaints laid against the police sure. just in the past year. We've now recently seen that there are 11 satellite stations uh, or IPID stations that will open across the country. But essentially, IPID has been underfunded uh, and under-resourced since at least 2015, and it still hasn't recovered to this point. Mm. So if they aren't able to police themselves and IPID is fighting a losing battle, mm. how do we then hold our police to account? Yeah. I think it really starts with the political leadership of the police. Mm. Uh, you know, we have a, a police minister who, whose job it is, is to be accountable to both parliament and to the people. Uh, I think what really this means, that uh, your average citizen has to make this an important issue for them in elections going forward. We have an election in 2024, and I think it's vitally important that this becomes an issue that we all care about and that we rally around. Um, I think there's also, you know, some level of, of individual work that can be done, whether it's supporting civil society who is trying to hold the, the police to account, organizations like Corruption Watch or the Social Justice Coalition, that sort of uh, work, the work that they do to keep police in account is really, really important. And lastly, not to engage in corruption ourselves. Mm. The more it happens, the more that it's, it's amplified and the more profitable it is, I think it's more, it's the more difficult it is to get rid of. I could talk to you forever. Zianda, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that was a very important conversation. We'll be continuing this conversation on policing, or lack thereof, on Carte Blanche, the podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching. Have you heard about our new podcast? It's like Carte Blanche, but without the Sunday blues. Find Carte Blanche, the podcast, with new episodes uploaded weekdays on all major podcast platforms. Unique stories, unique perspectives, wherever you go.